Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today we'll be going over some very simple but very important tumor terms. But first, we have to get into the disclaimer and that is that all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone and do not represent any of the organizations that employ me or that I may belong to. And that also this video is for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any questions about your oral or systemic health, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. For this video, I thought that it'd be very nice to take it back to some basics. So this video is probably best if you are a pre-healthcare professional student or a dental or medical student just starting your pathology courses, or if you just need a review in some very simple but very important terms that we use when we're talking about tumors. First, it's important to note that tumor is not a medical term. It is a colloquial or commonly used term for neoplasia. Neoplasia is a word when broken down really expresses that meaning. Neo meaning new, plasia meaning growth. It is new growth. This new growth grows disproportionately to the host. So it will grow despite whether or not the hosts themselves are also growing. We often break neoplasia down into two subcategories, benign and malignant. Most of this video will be breaking that down further to really discuss the differences between benign neoplasia and malignant neoplasia. Benign neoplasms are typically very well differentiated. They usually have a slower growth than a malignant neoplasm and are often more like the tissue of origin. So a benign nerve entity is going to look most similar to the native nerve in that host in that, in that person. Because benign neoplasms look so much like that tissue of origin, if that tissue of origin produces some kind of product like a hormone, for instance, a benign neoplasm might also produce that hormone or that product. And we call that a functional benign neoplasm, where that benign neoplasm is producing a hormone and that might cause systemic effects. So if you have a tumor that is growing independently of host control and it's producing all this hormone level, then that can be picked up in the blood and also produce some downstream effects in the result as a result of excess hormone. Benign neoplasms are often circumscribed, meaning localized to one specific area or encapsulated. Encapsulated meaning that there is a fibrous capsule that separates that neoplasm from the surrounding stroma or surrounding native tissue. Clinically, a benign neoplasm isn't going to be fixed, and that's because it is circumscribed or encapsulated. So if you suspect that there's a benign neoplasm, it's something that you're going to be able to feel all the way around. You might be able to freely move it around when you rub it. Uh, it's something that is very, very local and isn't necessarily fixed to the tissue. So it has really well-defined borders clinically and under the microscope. Most of these benign neoplasms are given the suffix of OMA, O-M-A. There are some very key exceptions to this rule, like lymphoma, which is a specific neoplasm of blood products, specifically white blood cells, and also melanoma, which is a malignant neoplasm or cancer of melanocytes. But for the most part, OMA, OMA are benign neoplasms, like leiomyoma, a smooth muscle benign neoplasm, or schwannoma, a benign neoplasm of the Schwann cells surrounding nerves. It's important to note that benign neoplasms are not always innocent. Remember, these are going to grow independently of host control, meaning if they aren't treated, they may continue to grow even if they are growing slowly. If these grow so large that they start to impinge on vital structures, like certain nerves or even growing into an airway and blocking it off or growing directly into the brain, then these can be lethal. So it's really important that benign neoplasms are treated appropriately because even though they're not necessarily what we think about when we think of cancer, they can still be deadly. 
In contrast to benign neoplasms, we have our malignant neoplasms. And this is what we think about when we think about typical cancers. These are typically less differentiated or less like the tissue of origin. So they arise from a specific tissue, but they may not look like it under the microscope quite as much. They typically have very rapid growth and grow very quickly, and they're not circumscribed or encapsulated. So they're invading into other tissues and they might spread their little tendrils into native muscle, native glands, and that causes them to become fixed or really difficult to differentiate from the surrounding tissue. Malignant neoplasms are often given a name ending in sarcoma or carcinoma. Carcinoma are derived from ectodermal structures like skin or glands, and sarcoma is from the mesenchymal structures. So for instance, osteosarcoma is a sarcoma or malignant neoplasm of bone, osteo. We often grade malignant neoplasms based on their differentiation. So a G1 or a grade one malignant neoplasm is going to look most like the tissue of origin. It is the most well differentiated. Whereas a G4 is the least differentiated. That is a poorly differentiated where it really doesn't look much like that tissue of origin. And then another important term is anaplasia. And that is when the malignant cells don't look anything like the tissue of origin. They've reverted back to kind of like a stem cell state where it's so poorly differentiated that we don't really know where it's coming from. It's important to note that because of that difference in differentiation, that not all malignancies act the same. So some malignancies are very aggressive and unfortunately lead to death very quickly, whereas some malignant neoplasms are pretty well differentiated and very easy to control and they can be quote unquote cured from surgery or from chemotherapy or radiation. A really important concept for these malignant neoplasms is the concept of metastasis. And that is when the neoplasm, that malignancy, is spreading to a distant site. There's two major routes that this occurs. The first is hematogenously. And that is when that cancer or that malignant neoplasm gets into the bloodstream and then ends up in some distant site. The second major route of transportation in malignant neoplasm metastasis is the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system helps with the drainage of our immune system as well as a lot of the other waste products or the fluids in our cells. We may actually be able to see that under the microscope where in this example, we can see those blue tumor cells going inside some sort of channel. That tumor is on its way to a different site. If a tumor is metastasizing via the hematogenous route, it often ends up in a place where the blood is being filtered. The blood in these places slows down and then waste products are removed, but that also gives the cancer an opportunity to leave the bloodstream and make a new home. The most common places for this are the bone, where blood products are made, the lung, where air exchange occurs with the blood, and the liver, where a lot of nutrients are removed. You can appreciate in this picture that this cancer, which was a renal cell carcinoma or kidney cancer, has spread to the lungs. The red is the normal lung tissue, and that white spiderwebby looking stuff is actually the cancer, which has found a home in the lungs. This is from a autopsy that I participated in during residency of a patient that died with widespread metastasis of that kidney cancer. In the lymphatic pathway, the final destination is oftentimes a lymph node. In this example, which is from a recent case that we received in my service of a mandible cancer, a squamous cell carcinoma, you can appreciate that these little lima bean lymph nodes have this area of white and that is the cancer that has traveled through the lymphatic system and ended up in the lymph node and then grew within that lymph node. 
under the microscope, you can appreciate that you can see the normal, very blue structure of the lymph node where all of those inflammatory lymphocytes are living. And then you can also see the more pink cells of that carcinoma that have found a home in that lymph node. Metastasis is usually a sign of advanced disease, meaning it's found often late in the course of that cancer. Unfortunately, there are patients out there where a cancer goes undiagnosed because it isn't producing symptoms or is difficult to see or to find, and it isn't diagnosed until a metastasis occurs in an area that's easier to see. In the oral cavity, for instance, about 25% of metastatic lesions to the soft tissues like the gum or the tongues are the first sign of a malignancy. So as an oral pathologist, I might be diagnosing a metastatic cancer and the patient might not even know that they have it. An important thing to remember here is that metastasis is spread to a distant site where we don't expect to see it. There are certain malignancies that can be multifocal. An example of this is multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma is a malignancy of plasma cells, which are an inflammatory cells and multiple in the name of multiple myeloma expresses that this is found in multiple primary sites. So a patient may have multiple myeloma in their jaw, in their spine, in their ribs, in their pelvis, and that's not metastasis, that's just the nature of the disease where it's found in multiple sites. A few additional terms that aren't neoplastic, but often get confused or thrown into conversations about neoplasia are teratoma, hamartoma, and chorostoma. Teratoma likely is a true neoplasm because it can grow at disproportionate rates to the host. Teratomas are comprised of all three embryonic germ cell layers. So the ectoderm, which give rise to things like the hair and the skin and the sweat glands, the mesoderm, which gives rise to things like cartilage and bone, and then the endoderm, which gives rise to things like blood vessels. Inside of a teratoma, we can see all sorts of things. Bone, hair, teeth, brain tissue, intestinal tissue, thyroid tissue, tissue that you would never expect to see in the ovaries or testes. The origin of these tissues are from pluripotent stem cells. These are the most immature of all of the stem cells and can give rise to any type of tissue. And that's why we can see any type of tissue in that lesion. The last two terms are likely not neoplastic because they do not grow independently of the patient. They grow proportionally to the patient. So as the patient grows, so too do these lesions. The first is hamartoma. Hamartoma is disorganized tissue that we expect to see in that site. So for instance, odontoma, which are little tiny toothlets that we see that are malformed, is often considered a hamartoma. That's because it occurs in the jaws. We have teeth that occur in the jaws, so we kind of expect to see it there but it's disorganized. They don't really look like real teeth, they just kind of look like little pieces of teeth. This is when you see that, that example in the news of 500 teeth removed from Indian boy's palate. It's really just a teratoma where they pieced out all of these malformed teeth and counted them. They must have a lot of extra time on their hands. Chorostoma, on the other hand, is disorganized tissue that is not native to that site. So example in the oral cavity would be an osseous chorostoma. That is when we see bone inside some place where we don't expect to see bone. The most common place for that, by the way, is the tongue. This is an example of an osseous chorostoma that I saw come through our service where we actually saw bone on the biopsy of this patient's tongue. There you have it a review of some terms that you absolutely have to know and be comfortable with if you're working in the area of pathology or tumors. And while this video is a little bit more basic than the other ones, it's really important for understanding. Be sure to check out my other Pathology 101 videos that help with some of the more basic concepts of pathology. 
If you like this video, please share it with someone else that may enjoy it as well or may find it useful. Don't forget to give this video a like, subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching and be well.